Hello, everyone. We are live. This is Elizabeth Mathern from Cook Baxter Immigration in our South Georgia office. Um, I am in Adel, Georgia, which is halfway between Tipton and Valdosta, right off I-75. So let's give people a few minutes to join. Today, I'm going to be answering people's questions live, if anybody has questions. Um, I also want to give you an update on some big news um, regarding asylum law in general. We, as I think I mentioned on one of my last Facebook Lives, we had a new decision from the Supreme Court that impacted asylum law pretty on a pretty large scale. Um, and that was an attorney general decision. Um, also, we've gotten additional guidance on how to apply for a prosecutorial discretion in our immigration court cases. So I wanna share a little bit with you about that, the information that we received on the types of things that the government attorneys want us to present uh, as part of those requests. And I am gonna talk, I'm gonna take this time, you know, if we don't have a lot of questions, I think I am gonna talk kind of in detail about the asylum law situation, specifically regarding domestic violence, fear-based claims, family unit fear-based claims, um, and a little bit about gang violence claims. I, um, I'm gonna try to keep this, you know, a fairly simple and approachable for regular people. This won't be sort of a talk for other lawyers. I wanna help empower people out there to understand the legal system. Hi, thank you for joining. Are you welcome? Welcome everybody, feel free to post where you're watching from. Um, I'm always happy to be here with you guys on Thursdays. Next two weeks may be a little different. I may not be on Thursdays. I may be on a different day. So um, stay tuned for that information. All right. So let's go ahead and jump in. I think we'll first start with talking about prosecutorial discretion, which um, is pretty specifically related to people that have immigration court cases. So many people um, also have other applications that could be processed by USCIS. But they might also just have an application that's that they're eligible for in front of the immigration court, like cancellation of removal is not something you can apply for in front of immigration. And um, so people are going to have to think about whether or not they actually want um, to have their case dismissed. It may be right for some people and it may um, not be right for others. So um, I think it's important to discuss the facts of your situation with your attorney and uh, make a decision, an informed decision for what's best for you. Um, you know, the government's trying to clear, we have what, a million and a half case backlog. So the government's trying to clear cases. Um, that's going to be their primary focus, not necessarily what is best for human beings and their families. So um, you've got to look out for yourself in that aspect. All right. So the guidance that we got for PD requests is um, that they want them to be submitted through electronic means. And they've, they've listed several documents that they think will be helpful in adjudicating these requests. Um, they want it to be clearly. Thank you. Are you? Thank you. I'm so glad you like to to watch to watch. Oh, okay, okay. I had asked for a number to inquire, but I gave it to him. I'm not sure what you mean, but if you need my phone number, I can scroll it across here if you need a consultation, okay? All right. So for prosecutorial discretion, um, they are going to look at your immigration history. How did you enter? When did you enter? Um, have you gotten a removal order before? Was it reopened? Did you enter with a visa? Did you ask for protection um, based on fear as soon as you got here? Things like that. Positive equities can be length of residence. How many family and community ties do you have to the United States? Do you have um, 
three United States children? Do you have no United States citizen children? Um, is every single person in your immediate family here in the U U.S.? If you don't have family in the U.S., do you have family outside of the U.S.? If you don't have family either place, what sort of community ties do you have? Are you a strong uh, member of your church? Are you, um, a, you know, a person who leads your community in important uh, things? Work history. Have you had a steady work history? Um, I think this takes into account that you might have been working without authorization, but um, that you have maintained you have maintained employment, you have taken care of yourself, put a roof over your head, or over your children's head. Compelling humanitarian factors, whether um, maybe a US citizen child is ill or um, whether, you know, like I mentioned before, maybe you have no family outside of the US. That could be a compelling humanitarian factor. Positive, uh, positive factors must be supported by evidence. This is something I talk to people about a lot. They just want me to say in a letter, my brother has this many children. And I always say, we can't just say you have children, you have to prove, you know, we need a birth certificate for each person. If you say somebody is your relative by blood, you have to have the birth certificates in between to show the relationship. So documentary evidence is important. Of course, a letter or an affidavit is some sort of evidence, but I always say, if you created it for this purpose, then it's not going to be strong as something that was created, as strong as something that was created for um, just a not related to your case purpose, like your light bill, your water bill. That's not created so you can use it for court, like an affidavit is, right? So that's been things that I say are third party evidence created maybe for the course of business are the strongest corroborating documentation. Um, also, you've got to address your negative equities. Maybe you have a criminal history. Maybe you had um, a situation in your life that you were working through and you're now on the other side of that. You've rehabilitated, you've, your life has stabilized, you've learned from your mistakes. Um, and taxes, they want to see that you've been paying your taxes. People who don't have a social security number can still pay taxes with an I-10, that's an individualized tax ID number. We recommend that people get those and file their taxes. Your criminal history has to, all your criminal records need to be provided if you want prosecutorial discretion. And a complete description of all your convictions. So that's gonna be a lot of work. If you don't know how to get copies of your criminal history documents, you're gonna to go to the clerk of court where the case was closed and you're gonna ask them for a complete copy of the file. That's the best way to do it. IRS transcript and then um, that's pretty much it. So there's your idea on what is needed for a prosecutorial discretion request. Let's see, um, I think we have a question. Okay, Ayub, I, the best way to get in touch with me is to call this number, 229-472-5775. You can, <coughs> excuse me, you can sign up for a free consultation that's probably going to end soon. We're probably going to have to start um, charging for consultations again now that COVID's somewhat under control and things are returning to normal. People are working again, all of that. So feel free to call, schedule a consultation, and we can talk about the individual facts of someone's case. And consultations, just so you know, consultations are confidential. All right, Usama Maruch, you're asking about, um, hi, Omar, nice to see you. Um, I'm on Facebook Live all the time. What do you mean you can't believe that I'm here? I'm here once a week, pretty much every week. I was even out of town last week and I still did my Facebook Live, so. Um, all right, let's see. Um, oh, Osama Maruch, I was gonna, answer your question about whether we had any news on DV 2021 or 2022. I don't, um, 
I'm sorry. Nice to see you too, um, Omar. I don't have any news, I'm, and I'm not giving any updates on litigation. Most of the time, I point you guys in the direction of Mr. Cook's Facebook Live, which is usually the day before I do my Facebook Live. Um, scroll down on our Facebook page, look for that, see if there's any litigation updates there. All right, so with um, the thing I'm going to move on to next is talking about asylum. And um, the Attorney General, one weird thing, if you don't know about this, in immigration law, the Attorney General is like, has a special role in, in, in immigration law. The Attorney General, who is the top attorney in our nation, can just pick a case and write a decision. So usually cases, you know, go from immigration judge to board of immigration appeals, to the circuit court, to the Supreme Court. So you can just pluck one and write the decision. So during the Trump administration, um, Attorney General Sessions and Barr issued decisions that attempted to eviscerate or like cut out a lot of really important parts of immigration law. So some cases that have been decided, one really pivotal one was ARCG, which recognized after like 30 or 40 years of advocacy, it recognized and it was a published, published decision that domestic violence could be a um, reason for asylum. And more specifically, it recognized women, um, let me read you the exact, the exact social group. Married women in Guatemala who were unable to leave their relationship was a cognizable um, particular social group. So that was huge, okay? And so because that was being finally recognized on sort of a nationwide scale, a lot of us were had been fighting that for a long time. In Atlanta, our, in the 11th Circuit, our courts have not really recognized that, and we'll talk about that in a minute, but um, it was a big deal. It was a really, really big deal. So what happened was that Jeff Sessions rewrote, took a case that was similar to ARCG and issued a decision that talked about a lot of stuff that didn't have to do with what that case was about and sort of just made this sweeping um, decision that said, like, basically, this probably isn't a social group and we, you know, uh, judges can still look at things on a case by case, by case basis, but this, this is um, not really what asylum was meant for, basically. So, um, and then there was another case that was called LEA, which is related to family groups being recognized as a particular social group. Okay, and that, that was a viable, a viable group it was distinct and you could use that as a basis for seeking asylum. So just backing up in order to win asylum, you have to prove that you have a well-founded fear of persecution based on one of the five grounds. A lot of people have heard of political opinion. A lot of people come to me and tell me that they're, they're filing for political asylum. Well, there's actually five types of asylum grounds and you, the, the, harm and the persecution needs to be related to one of the five the five grounds. All right, so we've got race, religion, nationality, political opinion, and particular social group. Particular social group is something that has been attempted to be defined through the case law over the years. And that's sort of where all this case law sort of circles around. What is a particular social group? How do you define it? What can, what can meet that definition? So LEA recognized, and that was, um, yeah, that was in 2000, where is it? LEA one, uh, recognized that um, family-based social groups was a thing, okay? Um, but then we had Sessions rewrite. And they were like, nope, 
not going to work. Well, Merrick Garland, our new attorney general, just issued um, a decision that vacated. That means like wiped out those previous decisions under the Trump administration totally. And in the decision, it said that adjudicators, which is judges or um, asylum officers, should no longer file follow AB1, AB2, and instead should follow pre-AB precedent that includes ARCG. Um, and there was some good good quotes in, in that decision talking about that, you know, that those other decisions spawned confusion, made it more difficult for adjudicators to make their decision, uh, took away flexibility in rulemaking, and basically made claims about like private acting, gang-based cases not being sufficient, but those kind of statements were in a case that had nothing to do with that. So um, the Attorney General Garlic Garland clarified that those those are not things that we need to follow because they don't help. They make things confusing, and they're not really based in any law. So those were vacated. So what does that mean for people seeking asylum now? It means that um, potentially there's there have been circuits where the courts still, in spite of what the attorney generals during the Trump administration did, still continued to adjudicate things in a favorable manner, still um, took ARCG as still alive. Here in the Atlanta courts, we've had, um, you know, we've got what a 93 and a 97% denial rates for the Atlanta Immigration Court and the Stewart Immigration Court. I think it's reversed. I think it's 97% denial rate in Atlanta, 93 in Stewart, something like that. Um, they were a lot of the arguments that were in um, Attorney General Sessions decision in AB were arguments that we were already hearing judges make down here. So um, wasn't anything really new. But this new decision clarifies things, makes it a little bit more clear that ARCG is good law, takes away those other decisions that created support for those confusing and negative um, approaches. But we'll just have to see how it's applied. But the good news is, is that we now feel a lot more confident in filing cases based on domestic violence, where women are seen as property in their community. Um, a lot more, a lot more confident that private actors or gang member cases, um, where someone's either being persecuted or harmed or um, threatened by a gang may be more viable than it was before. And also family unit cases where maybe um, someone's being targeted just because they're the relative of another person or because they're part of a large family unit. So maybe like there's one family in the town that um, uh, the government is treating a certain way or um, someone who the government cannot or will not control is treating the family in a certain way. All right, so that is my sort of summary of those decisions. And I hope that helps give you an idea of what is happening in asylum law. We've got some, some sort of new hope, new help on the horizon that those cases can um, be viable again. Now, with some of these, with, put that with prosecutorial discretion, and some of these cases being dismissed, if you originally filed maybe an affirmative case that never even made it to be adjudicated because maybe a notice to appear was filed shortly thereafter, maybe you filed an affirmative case within the first year, and then for some reason you were NTA'd, maybe it was you had a CFI and you were released, or there's all sorts of crazy scenarios where that can happen. You can get sort of things out of sync, and then your case was sent from an affirmative filing, which was not in court, to the court. I wonder now if, like, if your case is dismissed, you get to go back to the asylum office with your asylum case. Sometimes we have better 
um, chances of winning in front of the asylum office. So might create some additional options for people as well. Um, and then of course, if you had a case that sort of fell under the original case law, but then was denied based on the um, Attorney General Sessions decisions, maybe you could do a motion to reopen based on this new case law. So that's something that you might wanna talk to an attorney about. You're welcome to talk to me about it, if that is helpful. All right, let's see what questions we have. Data, what can you do to study in America? Oh, are you in Georgia, the country? Or Georgia, the state? Um, if you are outside of the US or you're currently on in status, you could apply for a student visa. And if you wanna talk more about like what the situation is with you and um, yes, the country. Okay, so you can apply for a student visa. We'd be happy to talk with you about that. Give us a call, set up a consultation. Okay, and we can go through that with you. All right, let's see if we have any other questions. I, um, I don't think people are in much of a question mood today. All right, Ayub, you're gonna have Elizabeth. Elizabeth is gonna ask me a question and you're gonna have her call me. I've had my, my number up here for anybody who wants to make a consultation. And if you just tuned in, my name is Elizabeth Mathern. I am the attorney in the South Georgia office. I am halfway between, I'm in Adel, Georgia, halfway between Valdosta and Tifton, which is right down I-75. I'm also like 37 miles from the Florida border. I'm really close to Florida. If you're watching us from North Florida, you're welcome to drive up and visit. Um, when I went to Tampa the other day, it's an easy drive. It's a really easy drive, just straight down 75. So, um, all right. Student visa, you can, if you wanna do some research on your own, it's an F, F, F1. Okay. And hi, Madat. No info on DV on DV 2021. Sorry, nothing new that I know of. We're all watching on pins and needles. Um, anybody who currently has a DV case, make sure you're interview ready. Make sure you're doing everything that's been asked of you. Make sure you're emailing KCC. You're checking your account. Um, if you are in a country where they're not doing any, any interviews or, or your processing country is where they're not doing any interviews, you might be able to get your location moved. We've been able to do that with some cases. And they seem to be moving along. So um, if you're a DV 2021 and you think you need some help in these last few months, um, we might be able to help. But just make sure you're doing everything that you're listening to Mr. Cook's Facebook Lives. You're doing everything that he mentions and advises people to be doing. You're keeping up to date with everything. You filed everything you're supposed to file. You're interview ready. Um, and you can move quickly. All right, let me see. Was there anything else that I wanted to share with you guys today? All right. Omar says, Oh, Omar's so busy. Good to see you too. Back to work. See you later, Omar. Okay, um, I'm trying to think. Usually I have people ask me about the Dream and Promise Act and the Farm Workers Bill. Haven't seen any movement on those and I don't have a lot of hope that there's gonna be any movement. Um, as we saw the January 6th commission didn't get very far and the voter voters um, protection bill didn't 
didn't even get brought to the floor for for um, discussion. So we have a really bad situation in our Congress right now. Um, it is very frustrating. So who knows what that means? I mean, I guess the president could start taking executive action for some of these things if if legislation isn't going to work. So we've seen that before. I mean, that's how we got DACA. It is not ideal because it is not a permanent solution and it can change with whoever is in power. Um, ideally, congressional legislation is a better option because it's more permanent, harder to flip back. Um, but at the same time, um, we're kind of at a standstill. Okay, I'm waiting for an interview time in Abu Dhabi. Nadat, have you emailed KCC? Have you have you been vigilant on keeping contact and sort of pushing them? I don't know if your files already made it to Abu Dhabi. I have um, emailed some of the posts and been able to start that conversation, but um, you might try that. All right, buenas tardes. Cuanto está tardando una cita para jueves después en caso cerrado? Apenas vi una persona que cero caso mobrilo. Oh, Amanda, um, este, este, well, I don't think I can answer you in Spanish. I don't feel confident enough in that, but I understand your question is um, it pr the case was probably closed in April when the office was still closed because of COVID maybe. So can you, how do you get it opened or how do you get an interview scheduled? Um, I would suggest reaching out to the consulate and trying to get them to issue an interview date. If they're telling you that it's closed, you might need a lawyer to help you with that. I don't know if there's anything we can do, but we might, you know, if there's special circumstances or you can prove that you contacted them when you were supposed to, maybe for asking for rescheduling or whatever happened, we might be able to help, okay? Um, why don't you reach out for a consultation and we can see. Your guest for the 9,095 visas. When is the final decision going to come? Um, I would imagine that it might come at the final hour, um, but I don't know. I think you go with whatever Mr. Cook um, is saying as the best guess, um, but at the same time, we're not fortune tellers, right? We can't see the future. Anything could happen. We just try to guess based on our experience, our knowledge, what we seen going on in the country and what judges are doing, but we cannot predict the future or see the future. All right, DV 2021, Ukraine. I can't, I can't even read your name. It's with letters that I don't know. Um, I don't, I don't have any updates on 2020, on DV. I um, would like for, I would like to give you, you know, a better answer, but the real information right now is just keep checking back, keep checking back. As soon as anything happens on any of the litigation cases or DV in particular, you'll hear from us for sure. All right. Um, okay, Mera, you saying that there it's still with KCC. Email them. Email them frequently. I find like they do answer, but I just keep sending them. That's all you can do. Um, and sometimes you'll get different answers to the same question, but just keep keep contacting them, keep pushing them. Say in your email that time is of the essence. You need your interview to be scheduled before September. 
okay? Jesus is asking, how long is it taking for my U.S. wife asking for my 10-year-old son as immediate relative? He lives in Colombia. I am not, so let's see, so he'd be an immediate relative. I'm not, uh, don't have on the top of my head how fast these um, immigrant visas for immediate relatives are being processed, but I would imagine that it's about 12 months um, based on like the backlog and all of that. Now, I'm sorry, I can't give you something more specific. Okay, let's see. Is there something due for F2 cases that have been documentary qualified? The Peruvian embassy is still giving few emergency dates. I, at this moment, no, not that I know of. Obviously, request emergency requests, something you can do, but if you have no legitimate emergency, um, I'm sorry, I don't really have a suggestion there. Some of these countries are going through a lot. Um, I did read, however, that, oh, what country was it? I forget. One of, I just read recently that one country that is having a massive COVID influx has still been able to process like virtually all of their visas, so visa requests. So it can be done. We just need the, we need the government to stop making excuses and get it done. So I'm sorry, Carlos, I don't have a good idea for you. I mean, God forbid that you have an actual emergency situation. Um, but barring that, I don't really have a way to, I mean, you can do an inquiry, you can send an email, but I don't know if that's really going to move the ball, especially because they're not doing the regular appointments. So sorry, I can't be of more help with that. All right, folks. Well, I have gone a little bit over on my time. I enjoyed spending time with you. Thank you so much for all the questions. Um, it was really nice. And everybody who said hello and um, watched and joined us. It was nice being with you. And I will see you next week. Take care. Have a great weekend. Bye.